welcome to another episode of History Editors. Today we're going to be doing a tour of various Jesse James sites here in western Missouri. I'm in Kearney, or Kearney, Missouri, at Mount Olivet Cemetery, and uh, this is the final resting place of the famous outlaw Jesse James. He was actually exhumed in 19. 95 so they could do some DNA tests to determine whether or not he was actually buried here and uh, they had like a 97 percent uh, probability from the DNA results that Jesse James is the one who's buried in that spot over there. Let's go check out his grave and we'll talk about a little bit about Jesse James. Right now, myself and my son Brandon are the only ones here in the cemetery, and it's a Saturday, so I'm just not sure how many people take interest in Jesse James anymore, but his grave is over in this direction. This is a pretty good clue right here, Jesse James. And then there's a marker over here I see with his name on it. This is the obviously the older part of the cemetery. Now you all probably know that a member of Jesse James' gang, a man by the name of Bod Ford, decided that he wanted the $10,000 reward posted by the governor of Missouri. So, dead or alive, bring back Jesse James. He was actually living in St. Joseph, Missouri under the assumed name of Tom Howard with his wife and his two children. Well, Bob Ford knew where he lived. He decided he was gonna just shoot Jesse James in the back of the head while he was straightening a picture on the wall in his house there. For many years, 16 years, he went throughout the country robbing banks and trains and all kinds of things from Texas all the way up to Northfield, Minnesota, where they had the disastrous raid on the bank up there. They generally targeted banks that were owned by Republicans. Now, Jesse James was obviously a Confederate sympathizer, and some bad things were done to him in the name of the Union cause. So buried here with Jesse is his wife, Zerelda Mims, who was the first cousin of Jesse James. A lot of people don't know that. Jesse James' father was a devout Christian. He went out to California to have a ministry for all the miners that flocked to California. He got to California and developed cholera, and he died there. He's actually buried in an unmarked grave in Placerville, California. Left his family without a father, obviously. Now, Jesse went to church as well. He was raised in the church, and he also wanted to be a pastor like his father. But things turned out far different. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he did a 180. He just went completely the opposite way. Now, Jesse James is actually buried right next to his stepfather, Dr. Reuben Samuel. He had married Frank and Jesse James' mother, Zerelda, in 1855. He was born in Owen County, Kentucky, in 1828. And he attended medical school in Cincinnati. Practiced medicine in Missouri before their marriage. He turned to farming her place in Clay County, Missouri. 1863, he was hanged three times by Union troops who were searching for Frank James and William Quantrill. He almost died and suffered brain damage. Jesse was also beaten as they tried to get information on his brother. In 1875, the Pinkerton firebombed the family farmhouse in their search for Frank and Jesse. Dr. Samuel's son, Archie, was killed and Zerelda was severely injured. He died in 1908 after spending six years at the State Mental Hospital in St. Joseph, Missouri. What a sad, sad thing that happened to this family. And here's Jesse's mother, Zerelda Samuel. Died in 1911. Here's the grave of Jesse James' stepbrother, Archie Samuel, born July 26, 1866, and he was killed by a bomb January 26, 1875. That bombing just infuriated Jesse James, caused him to go on a rampage against the Pinkertons, as well as the Republicans who were against the Confederate cause. Now, I don't know if it's poetic justice, but uh, Jesse James liked to steal things, and it looks like some people here have stolen a piece of his grave marker that chipped away parts of it. Maybe for a souvenir, but uh, you can tell that obviously it was chipped away a number of places there. 
It's a little known fact, and maybe it's a disturbing fact, but the Democrats in the Missouri State House were opposed to the reward that the governor had set out for Jesse James. They were sympathetic to the cause, and part of it was because of the bombing that took place at the James Farm. They were really upset about it. They kind of had some sympathy for Jesse James, and they really didn't want anybody to be going after him because of the reward. So they actually succeeded in attempts to whittle down the amount of the reward that Governor Crit Denon offered, and it ended up being about $10,000 reward. I'm sure that there's many others who deserve to be visited on this day. However, we are going to visit the birthplace of Jesse James, about three miles away from here. Pretty cool old cemetery. I wonder if they're related to Merle. It's funny what some people will put on their grave markers. Can you guess what he was uh, into? So Jesse James is buried over here, but off in the distance is a Sonic and a McDonald's. Crazy how modern life has crept up right next to Old West history. So apparently when they dug up Jesse James, they kept parts of the coffin that he had been buried in. And they are on display in St. Joseph, Missouri at the house where he was killed. All kinds of weird macabre things that they have on display and hope to get to it. Paintings illustrate Frank and Jesse's involvement with Contrail's Raiders, a renegade band of Confederates who terrorized western Missouri and eastern Kansas. So in this display case we have Reverend James pocket watch, Jesse James tie tack, and Jesse James collar button, but also the Jesse James shotgun. Boots that Jesse James wore when he was killed. Wow. He was killed in these boots. So he literally died with his boots on. Here's the last bridle used by Jesse James. How cool is that? That's supposedly a neck warmer. These are the personal effects of Alan Palmer, who was one of the raiders who married Jesse James' younger sister, Susan James. These spurs and riding gloves are reportedly some that Jesse James rode with. I'm going to see how my son measures up to the James gang. Yeah. Mom's taller than you. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that is the original Jesse James grave marker. And there's the lid of the casket that he was buried in, that they pulled up in, when was that, 1995? When they dug him up during the exhumation, they took these pieces off the coffin. And there's this chair. There's a feather duster that he was holding when he was shot. Are you kidding me? Wow. Oh my gosh, that's the picture he was straightening in when he was killed. Unbelievable. 
when Jesse James robbed the Northfield Bank in Minnesota, he was shot, and this is a bullet that was removed from his body. And uh, I believe it was a bullet that he sustained at Northfield. This black dress belonged to Anna Ralston James, wife of Frank James. Another case features some of her possessions, including a purse and a mirror. Jesse James grew up exploring these creeks and these woods. The reconstructed house is up here. And this is the original burial spot of Jesse James. Such a very cool area. My son Brett tagged along on me today. He didn't know a lot about Jesse James, and I would venture to say that most Americans don't know a whole lot about Jesse James. And I passed American U.S. history. Yeah, and you passed? <laughs> that says so much about the state of our education system in America. Not that, not that Jesse James was the most important topic, but I think a lot of people are interested in famous criminals. It's so peaceful today here. So this is in the reconstruction of the James home. Zelda left this house to Frank James after her death in 1911. Well, we're gonna, we need to go around to the porch. Dad just recorded a whole bunch of history hunters and then realized his microphone was off. My microphone system failed here, but I was explaining how Jesse's mother would sell to visitors a rock from her son's grave for a quarter to raise money until her death in 1911. When she ran out of rocks, she would just fetch some more in the nearby creek. It was also reported that she would carve Jesse's initials onto the handles of old pistols and sell them to gullible visitors. I was under the assumption we could go in, but this is how their bedroom looks. You cannot go in. I believe it's reconstructed though. Another bedroom. Reconstruction or not, this is kind of how they uh, sawed the wood and then patched it up in between. like this would be the kitchen. So hard to see, I'm sorry. There's a tour going on behind me, but this was the actual spot where Jesse James was originally buried. His mother owned the farm and had him buried here. Natural place, right? But this is kind of like the, uh, the rocks that were on the grave that she would actually sell to visitors who uh, wanted to come out here and have a souvenir from the grave. There were some people out here earlier taking pictures by this gravesite, but I wonder if they thought that he was actually buried in the ground here. He's not. He was moved later to the Kearney Cemetery that we visited earlier. But he was in the ground here for quite a while, and this is a uh, reconstruction marker, I guess you would call it. This would have been the same place. Look at that. Devoted husband and father, Jesse Woodson James, September 5th. 1847, murdered April 3rd, 1882, by a traitor and coward whose name is not worthy to appear here. And on this side, beloved wife and mother, Zeralda Amanda James, 1845 to 1900. And if I stand here, it's approximately uh, where the earlier picture that I saw was taken. There's a very tall tree here, planted right here on this same location where he was buried. Now, 
as everybody in the 1840s, 1850s, before the Civil War in Missouri, you had slaves if you had a farm. And, uh, you know, it's not right, obviously. But the Reverend Robert James came here from Kentucky to Clay County in 1840. He had six slaves here who lived on the farm. Charlotte, the oldest, remained in service of Zerelda, Frank's mother, Frank and Jepsey's mother throughout her life. In December 1869, Ambrose, who was a young boy, was believed to have warned the James brothers of an approaching sheriff's posse and assisted in their escape. During the ill-fated Pinkerton raid of January 1875, Charlotte and two of her children, Ambrose and Perry, were sleeping in the kitchen during the explosion. Charlotte suffered a minor injury. Perry was recorded as a mulatto, and it's believed that Dr. Reuben Samuel, Zerelda's third husband, fathered Perry. Little uh, dirty secrets in the closet. Following emancipation, Perry continually returned to the farm and sometimes he stayed here. Following his first wife's passing in the 1890s, Perry returned to help Zerelda manage her home and farm. He remarried again, had two daughters, Dora and Allie, and moved to Liberty, Missouri, where he became a leading member in the black community. And we get to peek in here and see kind of what they lived in compared to what the, the farm owner owned, the slave owner owned. A very tragic part of our nation's history represented here. Now right here is a plow and it represents the fact that 15 year old Jesse James was plowing a field near this location in 1863 when malicious soldiers surrounded him and demanded information on the whereabouts of his brother Frank James. They wanted him desperately. When Jesse refused to answer the soldiers whipped him, and then he ran to the house down there and found that his stepfather was brutalized. He was basically strung up to try to hang him, and uh, he was tortured, he suffocated, and then they tried to get the information from the family, but it did not, uh, did not work. The violence and the hatred of the Civil War led Jesse to join the guerrilla forces. Imagine this is the same ground that Jesse James tilled I don't know about you, but if you visit the homes of famous people, I've been to George Washington Carver's place here in the Osho, Missouri. I've been to Jack London's house. I've been to John Muir's house. I've been to President's houses, Harry Truman's house. And they always seem a little bit more real after I've visited their location. Now, I'm never justifying violence, but you can almost sense why Jesse James took the course that he did. Keep in mind, he wanted to be a reverend. <laughs> he was baptized in the Kearney Baptist Church. His father went to California to become a minister as well and died there. But uh, I don't know, it gives you a different perspective on people. Just imagine Jesse James out here working, minding his own business, when some really rough people came by and did some unspeakable things to the family. I understand Dr. Samuel was mental patient the rest of his life because of what they did. It probably starved oxygen enough to his brain to cause brain damage. But I did see that uh, incident on the movie Frank and Jesse. Right over here is the well. You would uh, come out here and pump that for water. I'm not sure if this is where the actual well site was. That's a grinding wheel. I can't imagine that this is original. I'm, I know it's not, but this is what you'd have to do. You'd have to come out here, wind, rain, snow, sleet, hail, hot summer, to relieve yourself. There's a two-holer here. I don't know about you, but the idea of going next to somebody else at the same time... Oh. I can't imagine that Zerelda was too happy with her son leading a life of crime for 16 years. Something tells me she probably thought it was justified. I understand she lost an arm or use of her arm in that blast that the Pinkerton agents inflicted when they came here. Kind of a dirty deal. Now there's some debate as to whether or not Alan Pinkerton really wanted to kill Jesse James or just blow up the house. But uh, some documents have been found that indicate that, yeah, his intent was to kill 
Frank and Jesse James thinking they were in the house. And they weren't in the house. Innocent people were in the house. <laughs> As you can tell, we've made our way to St. Joseph, Missouri, and this is the house that Jesse James lived in and the house that he was killed in. It's a museum. It was not here when he was shot. It was located up the street a little bit, two blocks away on Lafayette Street, which uh, is also marked with a marker indicating where it was. I think this house has been moved uh, twice. This is the third location. Thankfully, it's been preserved. I think it closes at four o'clock, so we got to get in there and take a look at it famous Jesse James house where Jesse James was killed. I put it on a hill kind of like where it was situated at the time he was killed and we'll just go up the steps and see what we can find up here. It's right next door to the Pony Express Museum which I don't think we have time. This says Jesse James home. Outlaw Jesse James was shot and killed in this house. April 3rd, 1882. It was then at 1318 Lafayette on the hill above the Pate house. It was moved here in 1977. Jesse James home given to the Pate House Museum in honor of the pioneers who contributed to the building of St. Joseph. Can you imagine? This is the actual house. That Bob Ford walked into to murder Jesse James. By the looks of it, it's been painted quite a bit, hasn't it? All kinds of little markers here. Tombstones from the 1850s Russell Cemetery south of St. Joseph, which was bulldozed in the 1970s. parlor where Jesse James was killed. It's important to note that the house does not contain the original furnishings nor the wall covering. So it was this location of the house right here where the assassination took place. Why is that the way it is? Oh, the big hole? Yeah. The big hole, when it's right up in its original location, uh -huh. And people were going through there. There were carbon pieces out of wall for souvenirs. Okay. This is a replica of the gun used to kill Jesse James. When he was killed, Jesse James was reportedly standing on a chair, which we showed you earlier, to straighten out or dust a frame on the wall. We initially understood that the artwork on display at the James Farm Museum was the actual piece, but the staff at the death house said theirs was the needle point that Jesse was tending to at the time of his murder. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this is, this is the original piece. That's the original needle point. A display inside the home turned museum gives details about the 1995 exhumation of Jesse James' body performed under the direction of forensic scientist James E. Stars of George Washington University. Although it was widely accepted that Bob Ford killed James to collect the bounty, some have insisted that Ford had murdered another man to help James in his ruse, a claim bolstered when a centenarian named J. Frank Dalton claimed that he was the real Jesse James in 1948. To put to rest the wild speculation that James wasn't killed that day in 1882, the James family requested their famous ancestor to be dug up for a DNA sample. DNA material from the body was compared with the DNA from descendants of Jesse James' daughter, Mary Susan James. The DNA results showed a 99.7% matchup and proved Frank Dalton to be a liar. When the grave was meticulously opened, last seen 90 years prior, the wooden casket had collapsed and compressed into a thickness of about 6 to 8 inches. Artifacts from the exhumation on display include the diamond-shaped obsidian tie pin buried with Jesse James, handles from the casket, the broken glass that was the viewing window on the casket, 
and the casket emblem that read, At Rest. Before the remains were returned to the grave, a plaster reproduction of Jesse's fractured skull as well as his teeth were made. Notes here indicate that the teeth had gold fillings and that he possibly gritted his teeth a lot. The biggest surprise came with the skull, which was broken into 32 pieces. When reconstructed, it showed the bullet did not exit the skull and did not hit the wall of the house. What then caused the bullet hole in the wall? Well, it's possible that Charlie Ford took aim at James and missed, or that Bob Ford fired a second round. During his lifetime, Jesse James had been shot several times with at least two bullets remaining inside his body. They were retrieved during the exhumation of the grave. The bullet on display here was fired by a Union soldier and had entered the right lung of then 17-year-old Jesse James as he was in the process of surrendering outside of Lexington, Missouri in May 1865. Look at all the porches of Jesse James up here. This one would be the most common that we know of today. Actually, about, I've always been about four years ago. I come in on a Friday and the glass was busted out of the door back here. They couldn't get in because of the grate. They busted that window they got in there. They busted the case out, took some letters, and they took the sign. The guy called back within six months and said if he, if he brought it back, it was a young kid. Hmm. If he brought it back, they, would they file charges on him? And our curator told him no. So he brought it back. But the curator did call the cops, but it took him 45 minutes to get here. What kind of letters did he take? It was there some letters still in the case in there from Frank James. They returned all the letters? Yes. Okay. These are not replicas? The, the one with Frank, no. I think it's this one here. But uh, the kid that brought it back, about eight months after he brought it back, him and another guy got caught up the street robbing, hmm. broke into a house up there, and the kid that was with him wow. ratted him out that he'd done this, and oh, he ended boy. up getting five years. That's supposedly Frank James Gunn. Supposedly. The okay. shoes supposedly were Frank's. The shaving mug was Jesse's. The glasses down here were Jesse's mother's. And this is supposedly wore by Frank James the rattlesnake tie. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. So we got ushered out because uh, it's time for them to close up, but we got to see some interesting things here. So we went up a couple of blocks to this location on Lafayette Street. It's on a hill here in St. Joseph, Missouri. And for some reason, I always thought this house was on a hill. But according to this, this is where the house was. This is the lot where Jesse James was murdered. It's crazy. But didn't imagine it like this. Jesse James Hill, outlaw Jesse James was killed here. April 3rd, 1882 by Bob Ford. The house is now on the grounds of the Pate House Museum, two blocks south. This hill has been lowered more than 50 feet. Okay, wow. So there was a hill here. Why did they mess with history like that? I mean, the house, they should have left it here. They should have left it just as it was. I mean, if you're going to be you know, a purist in terms of historical preservation, don't mess with it. That's my motto. When word spread throughout town that Jesse James was killed, crowds flocked to the house on the hill for weeks. In time, it was a tourist attraction with a charge to enter. In 1939, the home was jacked up and moved from its original location on Lafayette Street to the Belt Highway to draw curiosity seekers. It remained there for 38 years until 1977, when the home was donated to the Pati House Museum and moved to its present site. It's literally at the top of the hill. Well, 50 feet? I mean, the neighboring property is, uh, it must have been lowered too. I don't know about you, but that's always disappointing when I hear about stuff like that. You know, when I see that things have been altered so much that it doesn't even resemble the way it looked back in 1882 when he was shot and killed here. 
With the legend of Jesse James having grown to a larger than life status, it's easy to lose sight of the collateral damage to others. His murder would overshadow the lives of his widow and two surviving children who lost their father. Zerelda Amanda James was plunged into prolonged depression and would never remarry. She became a recluse, wearing black whenever she left the house. However, she remained devoted to the caring of her two children, Jesse Edward James Seven and Mary Susan James, who was just three. Although she was poor, Mrs. Jesse James refused to sell her story to magazine and book publishers. Her health took a marked decline in 1900, and at the age of 55, she died November 13, 1900, over 18 years after Jesse's death. After her burial at Mount Olivet Cemetery, Jesse's mother decided to have him relocated to be by her side in 1902. After his father was killed, Jesse Jr. was thrust into the role of trying to provide for his family at an early age. When he was 11, James Jr. became the breadwinner of the family by operating a cigar and tobacco store inside of the lobby of the Jackson County Courthouse in Kansas City, Missouri. It's reported that one of his customers was future President Harry Truman, who by the way once handled guns belonging to Jesse James. The Jameses would be haunted by the stigma as being an outlaw family. When a train was robbed outside of Kansas City in 1898, authorities tried to pin the job on Jesse James Jr. But the 23-year-old was not a criminal and he was acquitted of the charge. A year later, James Jr. wrote a book entitled Jesse James, My Father. It was billed as the first and only true story of his adventures. In 1900, just before the death of his mother, he married Stella McGowan in Kansas City. The union bore four daughters. Jesse Jr. became a lawyer and moved to Los Angeles in 1926 and opened a law practice as well as a restaurant called the Jesse James Cabin. The woman in front of the establishment holding a shotgun is Jesse Jr.'s daughter, Ethel Rose. The business was located at 11950 Washington Boulevard in Los Angeles. His emotional health suffered from financial failure, and in 1948, due to his mental issues, he was committed to the Norwalk State Hospital in Norwalk, where he died at the age of 75. He is buried in Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale. Jesse James' daughter, Mary Susan James, was only three years old when her father was murdered. She later married Henry Lafayette Barr on November 6, 1901, and gave birth to four children including a daughter who died as an infant in 1913. Mary was only 56 when she passed away in Kansas City on October 11, 1935. She is buried with her husband in the Fairview Cemetery in Kearney. Jesse James' last granddaughter died in 1991, more than a century after the famous outlaw Jesse James' death. On the day of the murder, Bob Ford was at the James house while Jesse made plans to take him to Platte City for a robbery. Bob Ford, with the encouragement of Brother Charlie, decided to kill James then and there with his wife and children in the house. Sentiment against Ford was widespread. Someone even tried to slit his throat in Kansas City the day after Christmas in 1889. He became a stage actor, recreating the dastardly deed. He later moved to Colorado where he opened a saloon and gambling parlor in Walsenburg, and then went into business in Creed. On June 8, 1892, Edward O'Kelly entered Ford's tent saloon with a shotgun. As Ford's back was turned, O'Kelly said, Hello, Bob. Ford spun around to see who it was, and O'Kelly fired both barrels, killing Ford instantly. <laughs> Bob Ford was laid to rest in Crete initially until his remains were moved and reinterred at the Richmond Cemetery in his native Richmond, Missouri. Inscribed on his grave markers are the word, The Man Who Shot Jesse James. This one's kind of hard to believe, but this little tiny cemetery contains the remains of Frank James, the brother of Jesse James. This is William Hill Park, given to Jackson County as a public park by Joe Lisley Hill, in memory of his father, pioneer resident of Jackson County. This is actually named after William Hill, who is buried right over there with Frank James. The odd thing about this cemetery is that there's a park here, and the cemetery, it's just a little section of it over here. I 
I mean, this is no bigger than a residential yard, but there's a cemetery right here, and there's Frank James, Alexander Frank James, and his wife, Anne Ralston. Alexander Frank James, 1843 to 1915. His wife, Anna, she was from a wealthy family who lived not very far from here. 1853 to 1944. Look how many pennies have been placed on this grave. On her side, I wonder. <laughs> I wonder if that's a commentary on the families here. I do have to say that for such a legendary outlaw such as this guy, there's not much fanfare in this neighborhood for his grave, which is kind of puzzling to me because Frank James was probably just as big of a criminal as Jesse James, only he didn't get shot. Now, he was the one who spent his retirement years showing off the farm. He would charge an admission to see the James farm that we showed you earlier. And I guarantee you that if Frank had met the same fate that his brother Jesse met, that he would be hailed as this great Western outlaw like, like his brother. As a side note, I understand that Anne was devastated after Frank died. She said that her life was over, basically. And that was in a letter that I saw that she had written to somebody. Another thing should be noted is that his ashes are buried here, not his body. Although he lived much of his life as a violent outlaw, Frank James had been raised as a preacher's son, surrounded by books, and during his youth developed a love for the works of Shakespeare. In May 1861, Frank James joined a Confederate unit and fought at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. He came down with measles and was left behind and captured by Union soldiers. After taking the oath of allegiance to the United States, he was allowed to return home. He later joined the infamous guerrilla raiders William Clark Contrell and William Bloody Bill Anderson and participated in various assaults on Union troops. After the Civil War, Frank James returned to the family farm. By 1869, the James brothers were involved in a series of bank robberies and murders. For the next decade, Frank intermittently lived the life of an outlaw and private citizen. Following the failed bank robbery in Northfield, Minnesota on September 7, 1876, in which two robbers were killed along with two citizens, the James brothers settled in Nashville, Tennessee, living under aliases. Frank lived with his wife Ann Ralston and son Robert under the alias of B.J. Woodson and raised hogs and racehorses. Frank wanted to leave behind his criminal ways despite being coaxed by Jesse. Six months after Jesse was killed, Frank turned himself over to Missouri Governor Thomas Crittenden. He reportedly unbuckled his gun belt and declared to the governor, quote, I want to hand over to you that which no living man except myself has been permitted to touch since 1861, and to say that I am your prisoner. Frank James stood trial for robberies in Missouri and Alabama, but was acquitted. He was never extradited to Minnesota for the Northfield raid and literally got away with murder. In his final 30 years, Frank James worked a variety of jobs, including a shoe salesman in Nevada, Missouri, a burlesque theater ticket taker in St. Louis, and a telegraph operator in St. Joseph. He inherited the family farm after his mother's death in 1911, offering tours for 25 cents a head. There he died at the age of 72 on February 18, 1915. Annie kept the remains of her husband in a bank vault for decades. She died July 6, 1944, and 20 days later, the ashes of both were buried in Hill Park Cemetery. Please leave us a comment about uh, this episode. If you liked it, we'd like to hear about that. And if you could give us a thumbs up, we would appreciate that as well. Tell your friends about History Hunters. Thank you so much. Yeah.